Um, when I took that class with Brother Numan here in, in this basement, uh, after the class, Brother Numan actually had a barbecue in his house. He used to live in Bay Shore in Long Island. And so not only did I was amazed at, at, by the class, when I went to the barbecue and Brother Numan, I, I just saw him playing basketball and I was just shocked. He says, SubhanAllah, that's crazy. This guy does Arabic and he does Kreet of Sir and this, you know, Malana also does plays basketball so well. So, alhamdulillah, uh, that really changed my perspective about Imams and things like that. It really had a lot of, a lot of uh, impact. <laughs> Um, ben Numan is the founder and CEO of Bayna Institute. His first exposure to Arabic study was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where he completed his elementary education. He continued Arabic grammar study in Pakistan, where he received a scholarship for ranking among the top 10 scores in the National Arabic Study Board examination in 1993. But his serious study training in Arabic began in the United States in 1999 under Dr. Abdul Sami. Under Dr. Abdul Numan developed a keen Methodolic understanding of Arabic grammar, he further benefited from Dr. Abdul Sami's by internalizing his unique teaching methods and later translating his work into English for the benefit of his students. But Numan served as professor of Arabic at Nassau Community College until 2006 and, ta and has taught modern standard and classical Arabic at various venues for nearly seven years with over 10,000 students nationwide. Shabbat Numan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidi al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in thumma amma ba'd fa a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim ar-rahman u'allama al-Qur'an khalaqa al-insan u'allamahu al-bayan uh, I'd like to start by uh, making a couple of corrections. I hope I don't do crazy tafsir, as was mentioned in the introduction. And I, second, I'm not an imam, um, alhamdulillah. So, and um, at the, the third thing I'd like to say just in the introduction is I'm extremely happy to be here. The only thing that makes me sad is I didn't get to see your imam. Uh, may Allah return him safely from hajj, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and it's a wonderful resource that you have. Um, and I originally actually prepared a different set of ayat as Imam Abdul Nasser had indicated, but it was said in the introduction, and then the ayat, you know, uh, Muhammad recited them, mashallah, so beautifully, the ayat from Surah Rahman. So I changed course in the middle of Imam Abdul Nasser's talk, and I've decided to give you some reflections from Surah Rahman instead. Uh, and also because it was announced, I think some of you might have come under the impression that we're going to cover those ayat. So I didn't want to leave you disappointed either. I'll, I, obviously, I can't do justice to these ayat in a limited time. And I'm, uh, f I like to think of myself as someone who has a lot of respect for attention span. So the moment I see any eyes roll upwards, I will cut it short and you know, call it an evening, inshallah. So I'll be looking for those of you, uh, inshallah. So we're we'll looking for you carefully. But anyhow, uh, obviously, we can't talk about the entire surah. But I will share some reflections, inshallah, about the beginning of this remarkable surah of the Qur'an, surah number 55, so often recited, uh, surah Ar-Rahman. The first thing I'd like to share with you is a principle of the Qur'an that Allah Himself lays down in the Qur'an. And that is, it's in a small phrase, I won't even give you the entire ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ So that they may reflect deeply upon His ayat. So they may engage in the activity of tadabbur. So this is called tadabbur, deep reflection, thinking, pondering, trying to understand what is the meaning behind these words. Literally behind, because tadabbur comes from dubur, to be behind. So you know when you really want to understand something, in English they say know it backwards and forwards, inside and out. The closest thing to that in English, you know. So you so we have, we have a deep understanding of the ayat. And now what's interesting about that phrase, one of the many things, is that when Allah Azza wa Jal gives us a statement and it's broken up into many ayat, Ar Rahman Allam Al Quran is actually one sentence. It's not two sentences, it's one sentence. But it's two ayat. It's two different ayat. So, in light of that principle, what Allah is demanding from us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost, is each ayah should be reflected on for its own merit first. As a sentence, as a as kalam, as speech that is continuous, that's 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 its own right. But Ar-Rahman by itself is enough for you to reflect upon. 
That word in and of itself is something that deserves your attention. So even though that statement is so powerful, Ar-Rahmanu Allam Al-Qur'an, that statement in and of itself is incredible. But Allah stopped at Ar-Rahman. He made that an ayah. And then He gave us the ayah, uh, you know, Allam Al-Qur'an. So what is it that we should reflect upon in the word Ar-Rahman? I'll start with the most basic, the easiest thing. I think anybody here, people who know Arabic or don't know Arabic, at least know this word because they say it every day. Every day they say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Every day they say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The word ar-Rahman is something you hear all the time. And probably all of you, if not most of you, know the, the meaning of the word too, or at least some idea of the meaning. It has something to do with mercy, or Allah being merciful. So the first thing that you and I are being asked to reflect and ponder upon is, how is Allah merciful to me? What does that mean? What is Allah doing for me right now that is a display of Allah's mercy? That's the first thing. You have to now, every person for themselves has to just get lost in thought. What are the things Allah has done for me that are acts of mercy by Him today? Right now, this week, this year, you know? From, from the things that have happened to you personally, from the things that are going on with your children, the things that are happening with your parents, Somebody's parents got sick and Allah gave them shifa. Somebody's children were not doing so well and Allah gave, made them better. Somebody was in a position of fear. Somebody lost their job. Somebody's enjoying health. SubhanAllah. And, and we have a roof over our heads. We have food on the table. We have you know, drinks in the fridge. We have these things to thank Allah for. And these are all manifestations of Allah's mercy. So if you were to try and make a list of things that you're grateful for or that you think are a proof that Allah is merciful to you, or to me, then that list would just keep going on and on and on. We'd be lost in thought forever. SubhanAllah. Such a deep statement. But I'll take it a step further now. And at a step further, Allah gave us two names of His mercy. The ones you recite all the time, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. But in this ayah, Allah chose this particular one. The word Ar-Rahman, you want me to use yeah. this one too? Okay. The battery is low on this one, by the way. I'm going to tell you now. So. Are they? Okay. So. Is that better? I feel better at this one. Okay, so, so the word Ar-Rahman is different from Ar-Rahim and that, there's a lot of commentary about that but I'll just summarize it for you because I want to make a lot of other, I want to share a lot, a lot of other things with you inshallah. One of those things is that the word Ar-Rahman doesn't just mean merciful, it is Sigatul Mubalagha which means it is extremely, unimaginably merciful. It's overwhelmingly merciful. It's incredibly merciful. That's one thing. The second thing is the word Ar-Rahman indicates because it's, it's the hyperbole or it's the powerful form of what's called an ism fa'il. It's originally ism fa'il and becomes mubalagha. What that simply means is someone who's doing something right now. They're doing something right now. So when we say Ar-Rahman, one of the meanings inside that word is Allah is doing something incredibly merciful right now. Or He has done something incredibly merciful. It points to something specific. And to make that easier for you to understand, if I say something like, someone is nice, someone is nice. I didn't specify any action. I just said they have a quality that they are nice. But if I say someone is being nice, someone is being nice. Am I being more specific now? When are they being nice? Right now. And they must be doing something particular, which makes me say that they are being nice, right? So it's more particular. Ar-Rahman is much more specific, much more particular. And it is fitting that Allah uses Ar-Rahman because then He mentions specific mercies. In the surah, He mentions a specific list of mercies. So the entire surah, its texture, how we understand this surah, is in light of that one word, Ar-Rahman. It's like if you don't understand that word, you cannot understand the surah. You cannot understand all of the other ayat. They, they, they color all of the text. They color all of the other lessons of this surah. And so now when we make a list of all of those mercies that we can think of that Allah gives us, Allah decides to give us, you know how when you make a list of uh, mercies, you think of the first thing that comes on your mind, that's one way to make a list, right? First thing that came to my mind, second thing that came to my mind, third thing that came to my mind. Another way of making a list is probably in the order of priority. The most important thing first, or the biggest mercy first, then next, then next, then next. Well here is Allah's list of priority. Of the things that are a proof of Allah's mercy, the, the thing num at number one is Allam al Quran. He taught the Quran. When you can think of all the things Allah has done for you and me, the first thing that we should think of that is proof that Allah is unimaginably merciful is not just that He gave the Quran, 
at al Quran. Not just that he sent down the Quran, anzal al Quran. He said, Allam al Quran. He taught the Quran. He used a very particular phrase. He taught the Quran. Now, in this word, the first thing we learn, and if you go very simply, I, I think all of you know the next ayah by heart. Ar Rahman, Allam al Quran. What's next? Khalaq al Insan. Allah mentioned our creation next. He created the human being. So He says, the, incredibly, the one who's being incredibly merciful taught the Qur'an, created the human being. But wait a second, creating the human being, I would think comes first, then teaching. But Allah is teaching us here, this, the fact that you exist even, the fact that you and I are even created, is less of a mercy. And the fact that Allah taught us this Qur'an is a greater mercy. This is a bigger mercy than my own life. Allam al Quran first, then Khalaq al Insan. Then, if you look at the word Allama, you find something remarkable. You know, the word Allama is what's called transitive in English. They call it, uh, it has ta'addi, they say in Arabic. What that means is when you say taught, taught, you think of two things, at least. You think of a teacher, and then you also think of who? The student. So there's a mu'allim and there's a mu'allam. There's a third thing too, which I'll mention in a second. But if Allah says He taught the Qur'an, what role does He take? Teacher. Teacher. When you mention, I taught, like if I say, I taught Arabic or something like that, if I said that, the obvious question that would pop in somebody's mind is, well, who did you teach? Who did you teach? Allah did not mention the student. Allah said He taught the Qur'an. He didn't say He taught the human being the Qur'an. <coughs> He taught people the Qur'an, he taught the messenger the Qur'an, he taught Jibreel alayhi salam the Qur'an so he could teach them. Nothing, he just said he taught the Qur'an. And you know what the mercy of that is? It's open. Anybody can become the student. He didn't restrict it. He didn't limit it. He just said he taught it. Who's going to be there to teach it? Who's going to be there to learn it? وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلْذِكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ It's an open challenge. Is there anybody coming forward? Anybody want to learn? Anybody want to become the student? SubhanAllah. And then the other thing is, you know, people pay extra money to go to an expensive school. Right? I didn't, I went to CUNY. So, so <laughs> they, but they, but people pay extra money to go to an expensive school. And they may, maybe, uh, you know, if you're in higher studies, you look for the top specialist in that field, and it's an honor to study under the top specialist of that field, or to attend their lecture, or to become, you know, to become, come under their tutelage, etc., etc., right? It's considered kind of a high privilege. And so a lot of these lofty institutions of learning, they tend to be very expensive also because their faculty is very high caliber. You know, they're very high caliber faculty. So when you, get an, uh, when you get to study from somebody high up, then it's considered a major honor. In this case, who is taking the credit for being the teacher? Allah. Allam al-Rahman. He's teaching. So whoever becomes the student, in the end, who's the teacher? Can there be a bigger honor than that? I mean, it's already merciful enough that He created us. But now He's giving us this unimaginable mercy of being our teacher. Of being our teacher. Now, so you, but you can think, no, no, no. Allah didn't teach me the Qur'an. My Sunday school teacher taught me the Qur'an. You know, the, you know. Or Hafiz Sahib taught me the Qur'an. Listen, Allah Azza wa Jal teaches Jibreel alayhi salam. Jibreel alayhi salam teaches Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam teaches the Sahaba. The Sahaba teach generation and the next generation, so on and so on and so forth, until your Sunday school and then you. And then inshallah your children and then others, right? But in the end, in the end, Allah is saying, no, the translation didn't teach you, the YouTube video didn't teach you, the tafsir book didn't teach you, the imam didn't teach you, the teacher didn't teach you. In the end, who was the teacher who gave you this honor? It was Ar-Rahman. You should be appreciative. Ar-Rahman allam al-Qur'an. He is the one who taught the Qur'an. Another lesson inside this, this amazing thing that Allah has said. If you get a really expensive gift, if you get a really expensive gift, and you know it's expensive, I come over to your house, and I say, here's something I, I got for you, it's very expensive. And I say, oh, I love it, thanks. And you throw it behind your head. <laughs> right? Or you throw it out, the, you know, out of the house. In front of me. I, I'm seeing you not show any appreciation for this gift. Thanks a lot, this is awesome. And you just kind of put it by the shoes or whatever, you know? Is that an insult or no? 
Allah decides to teach anybody who would want to learn. And of course, the first in line should be the mu'min, the believer, the Muslim. They should be the first in line to say, I am ready to take this honor of learning Qur'an. Because Allah decided to give me the mercy of being the teacher. So if you and I don't spend the time to become a student of Qur'an, if you and I don't spend the time with this book, to recite it, to learn its tajweed, to try and memorize it, to try to understand it, to try to look, to be students of it, to really be students of it, and to appreciate Allah as the teacher of it, then who are we really not appreciating? We're really not appreciating a gift Allah gave. And you know, the only reason someone would throw a gift or put it on the side, sometimes you get a blender in your wedding gift, you know, and it's okay for you to put it in the, sh in the closet. Because you don't value this gift, it doesn't mean much to you. And the fact that you never use it, you never even look at it, is pretty good proof that you don't like it, or you don't really appreciate it. Even if you tell your cousin, whoever, I loved it, it was awesome, great. You're just saying that, you don't mean it. The proof is in the pudding, the proof is in the fact that it's in the closet. So if Qur'an is sitting on the shelf the entire time, you know, it doesn't get any of my time, it doesn't get any of my attention, then you, you and I can say anything we want, we can say we love the Qur'an, it's amazing, it's beautiful, but the proof is already there that you don't value it. The proof's in the time you spend, the attention you give, the value you give to it. So this mercy of Allah, Ar-Rahman, if you appreciate Allah's mercy, an immediate effect of that would be you and I would become students of Qur'an, may Allah make us students of His book. Okay. Then, on top of this, in, in, in addition to this, when Allah Azza wa Jal says in His phrase, Allam al-Qur'an, and I said He didn't mention who, I said it's not limited to a person. But also that a thought probably crossed your mind and I should just spell it out. It's not even limited to generation. It's not like he taught one generation and that's it. He continues to teach. Whoever comes to this book seeking guidance, whoever comes to this book with good intention, then it is he who is teaching. It is he who will continue to, to guide them. One has to have sincerity. One has to really be looking for Allah's mercy though. One has to be that way. Now, the Qur'an itself. Allah Himself is incredibly merciful. He taught the Qur'an, but you know our children nowadays, they, and ourselves even, we're exposed. When we think of the Qur'an, uh, not Qur'an, we think of the Qur'an. <laughs> what thoughts cross your mind? Sharia law. <laughs> you know? It's tyrannical, it's barbaric, it's merciless, it's, you know, it's... It's, it's, it's a very angry book, it's very hateful, you know, all this rhetoric, all the time. Not just in the media, but even maybe things you hear from your co-workers, maybe you hear from your political science professor in college, or, you know, and, and kids hear it from other kids in high school. You hear this kind of thing all the time. The last thing you hear with Qur'an is that it's mercy. You don't think of it like that. that because you don't, we don't hear that. What does Allah say? وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ wa Rahmatun lil mu'mineen. Wa rahmatun lil mu'mineen. We send down from the Qur'an something that is a cure. A cure. And by the way, when somebody is sick, the biggest thing they can thank you for is what? The cure. That's the priceless thing. If somebody is, for example, they have all the wealth in the world, but they're dying of a disease. And you say, what do you want to pay for a cure? What, what are they ready to pay? Everything. Every, give me this cure, that's it. The cure, the word cure, basically what Allah is teaching us is the most valuable thing a sick person needs. There's nothing more valuable to a sick person than the cure. Nothing more valuable. And Allah says, what I sent in the Qur'an is a cure. Wa rahmah and a mercy. Wa rahmatun bil is it? So what He taught itself is merciful. It's not a source of putting us in difficulty. يُرِدُ اللَّهُ لِيُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ Allah wants to make your burden easier for you. Not to make your life harder for you. The purpose is, you know, the, the Qur'an came to make your life easier. It came as a mercy, and it came from the merciful. SubhanAllah. Then he says, خَلَقَ insan. Amazing words again. You know, it, it's simple, in simple translation, you just read, he created the human being. But the word insan is very uh, unique commentary about the origin of the word insan. And it's argued essentially to have come from two origins. There are two kind of opinion, lines of opinion among linguists and, and even among Sahaba. One kind of opinion, one line of opinion is that the word insan comes from nasiya. Nasiya, which means to forget. To forget. So insan literally means the forgetful one. 
the one who forgot. Now the question is, the one who forgot what? You have to know something to forget it, right? Before we came to this earth, were we introduced to Allah? We were. We were introduced to Allah. And if you don't know that, you should look up Surah number 7, Surah Al-A'raf, Ayah number 172. I talk about that ayah often. In which we took a covenant with Allah before we even got here. We took an agreement with Allah. The problem is when we come to this earth, we, what, what happens to us? We forget. And of course, when someone forgets, what's the thing that will benefit them? Reminder. Reminder. Now you tell me, one of the main purposes of the Qur'an, and one of the main definitions of the Qur'an, we even heard it in the previous lecture. وَمَا هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Qur'an is nothing but a reminder. كَلَّا إِنَّهَا تَذْكِرَةً It is, no, 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 it is nothing more than a powerful means of reminding. Powerful means of delivering reminder. Qur'an itself, إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ وَقُرْآنٌ مُبِينٌ It is nothing but a reminder. So if somebody by definition is forgetful, what would be the most beneficial thing for them? Reminder, Qur'an. There's a correlation between the two. Others say the word insan comes from, you know, this, from um, the root origin of seeking love, you know, or uns, uns, you know, this uh, compassion. And it's considered the opposite of al-wahsh, meaning like wild beasts and animals, when they're about to go and have lunch or eat or whatever, like a gator or a lion or something, they're not going to be nice to the rabbit before they say, you know, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, but they just go at it. But human beings have the ability to show mercy to each other and even to other creatures and they can, you know, so they, they have this unique quality of love and compassion. And so someone who is pre-programmed with love and compassion, the perfect thing for them would be a message that is full of love and compassion. Quran. خَلَقَ insan. He created, and this, you know, the, the, the ayah Allah, that comes to mind, Allah says, أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ Doesn't He know who He created? Whenever you buy something, so, something complicated definitely, when you buy something complicated, doesn't it come with a manual? Right? And so you're like, this manual makes no sense. And the manufacturer can argue, no, 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 I know what I made, this is the manual. Right? Allah literally says in the Qur'an, أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ doesn't he know who he created? Didn't he send this manual for someone he designed himself? It was perfectly designed for him. Khalaq al-insan. Okay, so now we got to this point. I'm skipping a little bit, but we got to this point. But I, I didn't talk a little bit about the word Qur'an. I, I should have mentioned some things. The word Qur'an itself comes from, you know, some ulama com comment al-makru, al-mubalagha. It's, 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 it's a kind of word which means something that is read a lot. Something that is read a lot. So, when someone says, I'm learning Qur'an, or someone says, I'm appreciative of the Qur'an, I appreciate that Ar-Rahman taught me the Qur'an, the proof of that would be in what practice? Reciting the Qur'an, add one more phrase to that, reciting the Qur'an, a lot. A lot. That would be a proof of it. Because by definition, Qur'an is something, by definition, it demands to be recited a lot. It's something that should be repeated over and over and over and over again. It's something that has to be done. It's something that has to become the light part of the life of a Muslim. And so that Muslims never forget that. You know what Allah did? Because you might argue, I don't have time. I don't know when I'm going to recite Quran. I don't know if I can, you know, take out 30 minutes, 20 minutes of my day because I have other things that I have to do. What Allah did was Allah gave us a program, a schedule, in which you cannot help but after every few hours, you stand and you recite Quran. What, what schedule is that? Salat. That's a mercy from Allah too. That's a mercy from Allah too. SubhanAllah. So you keep reciting this book. You keep reminding yourself over and over and over and over again. At the end of all of this, he says, عَلَّمَهُ bayan. By the way, the Qur'an came down in clear, beautiful Arabic speech. And if human being, the, the forgetful human being that is looking for mercy and compassion, wants to benefit from this Qur'an, well this Qur'an came in beautiful speech, in perfect speech. So to learn, if you're, if you're going to take a class, like you're going to take Accounting 201 or 301 or something, you know, you better learn the language of Accounting 101 as account, the accountants are smiling. I should have mentioned programming, or, you know, so, right? You have to know the language of what you're going to study. So to make the human being capable, capable of benefiting from this book, Allah said He even taught him, the human being, He taught him Al-Bayan. Al-bayan means the ability to speak clearly, to understand speech, to communicate, right? Allah gave us that ability. 
this thing that we have, the ability to speak, Allah says, Allah I'll share a few reflections with that and I'm done, inshaAllah ta'ala, pretty much. Or almost. Okay. So here, here's what I want to share with you. The first thing. Didn't Allah say He taught the Qur'an? He said that, right? And what word did He use in Arabic? Allama. For teaching the Qur'an, He used Allama. When He taught the human being speech, what word did He use again? Allamahu al bayan. Allama came up again or no? You know what this teaches us? Not only is Allah, one of His amazing mercies that He's the teacher of Qur'an, He is also the teacher of language. And he didn't say al arabiya Allamahu Al-Arabiyya. He said Allamahu Al-Bayan. What does that mean? Which language? All languages. And because of that, we have to have respect for all languages. We should not be people that make fun of other people's languages. We should not say English is the language of the kuffar. <laughs> I've heard a khutbah like that not too long ago. I was, I was listening to an Arabic uh, uh, YouTube video. And the, the khatib was very fired up. لا تتعلموا لغة جورج بوش وتعلموا لغة نبي like, Dude, <laughs> don't learn the language of George Bush. No man, it's... It, you know, that's not, that's not how it works. Allah taught all language. He honored all languages. But then of all of these languages Allah taught, because in the end, Adam salam was taught speech by Allah. And all the languages are byproducts of what Adam salam himself was taught. So in the end, the credit goes back to Allah. Whether it's Korean or Thai or Punjabi or Bangla, it doesn't matter. The credit goes back to Allah. But of all of these languages, Allah chose one and honored them above them all. That does not mean the others are not, not to be respected. The other thing that we learn from this ayah, which is remarkable, is the, the ability of you and I to speak is an honor from Allah which is being compared to the honor of teaching, teaching what? The Qur'an, which means we should respect our tongue. We should say things knowing that this, is a, this gift is an honor from Allah. It should not be used for filthy, vile, low things. It should be used for high things. You should do justice to what Allah has given you. And if someone uses this tongue that Allah gave for such a high purpose, and uses it for filthy language, and for dirty jokes all the time, and that's all that comes out of their mouth, then this is an insult to what Allah gave inside this mouth. This tongue was given so you can recite Qur'an. Allama al-Qur'an. <laughs> then Allama al-Bayan came later. You know? It's an amazing thing to reflect upon. That our language would go through transformation if we appreciated what it is that we have. What it is that Allah has given us in our mouths. And of course, in, the, in this amazing passage, these few ayat, there's extreme of everything. Ar-Rahman, the name that describes Allah's most extreme mercy. The Qur'an, the most extreme application, manifestation of that mercy. Al-Insan, the greatest creation of all of Allah's other creations. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. We honored the son of Adam. He's given an honor above all other creation. You know, وَفَضَّلْنَا عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِمَّا خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا We gave him an honor, a preference over much of everything else that we've, we've created. So, the, the, so there's one other extreme. Then on top of that, the ability for us to speak, another uh, incredible thing. I mean, look, think of all of the literature and all of the intellectual traditions of all of the societies that are filling libraries all over the world. All a product of عَلَّمَهُ bayan, Just a product of that, you know. All of the knowledge that we have today, all of the technology that we have, everything that we look around boils down to sciences or fields of study that are full of just words and verbs and nouns and adjectives and prepositions. That's all it boils down to is language. Even in modern philosophy now they're saying the root of all knowledge is language. Language is the key. They're coming back to what Allah started with, subhanAllah. You know? I don't need it, it's okay, I'm, it's all good. Yeah. So now because these, all these extremes are there, now we should connect all of them. If one wants to become a recipient of Allah's most extreme mercy, and they have been created above all of other creation, and one of the signs that they are the best of all creation is they have been honored to have learned the ability to speak. What is the best use of that speech? Qur'an. Become student of the Qur'an. That would be doing, you would be trying to do justice, and I would be trying to do justice so the, this, this mercy that Allah has given us. You know in this surah, and this, these are my last few words with you inshaAllah ta'ala. As soon as this passage is done, 
Allah starts talking about something other than the human being. الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ بِحُسْبَانِ وَالنَّجْمُ وَالشَّجَرُ يَسْجُدَانِ وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ الْمِيزَانِ What just happened? The beginning was about Qur'an. The, 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 tree, the sun doesn't learn the Qur'an. The moon doesn't learn the Qur'an. The sky doesn't learn the Qur'an. Allah mentions these things. Who learns the Qur'an? Who's supposed to be learning the Qur'an? The, primarily the human being and secondarily will learn in the surah even the jinn. That's going to come a little later in the surah. But why switch over to the other creation? Well, Allah created many other things around us too. And when He created these other things, they do exactly what they're supposed to do. Ashamsu. Wal Qamar, what does that mean folks? The sun and the moon, bihusban, they, li- they exist by a very precise calculation. They're told, what Allah, Allah, Allah tells them what to do and they do it exactly, precisely. They are so precise, you can even make your calendar based on either the sun or the moon. Right? So it's a proof of how precise, you know, how precise these, these creations of Allah are. And then he says, you know, when najm was shajaru, even the, the the star and the tree, and other interpretations of najm also, they even they they fall in such that there's imagery in this ayah. You ever seen a shooting star, right? Like it shoots like that. So some ulama say this is an image of the sajda, like it's falling into sajda. But you know, when najm. Others talk about the, the shadow of the tree getting long, that even the tree makes sajda. When its shadow gets longer, it's like it's falling into sajda. Or when its, when its branches bear fruit, the branches come down like they're going into sajda. Right? SubhanAllah. You know what that does? When you're walking down, you know, walking up, up and down like uh, 168 and you see trees, you should just remember sajda. And I, I'm serious. It changes the way we look at the world around us. And I know it's very hard to see stars in New York City. Right, so if, if you ever get a chance to go to Albany or like out in the boonies somewhere, it, Texas would be nice, yeah. You know, you look at the stars, what should they remind you of from because of these ayat? Of sajda, of submission. When you look at su- the sun and the moon, you know what they should remind you of? Discipline. Sticking to time. Because they follow precise calculation. You know, in this comparison, what Allah is teaching us? Look, I made you the best creation. These creations are awesome, but they're less than you. But even though they're less than you, look at how much better they're doing. They're doing what they're supposed to do. And you were, crea- you were even taught the Qur'an. They weren't taught the Qur'an. You were taught the Qur'an. You were given bayan. You were created in this high form. And by the way, it's something I should have mentioned that ties to what was in the previous talk. When Allah says, Allah al Quran, for human beings, the teaching of the Quran begins with who? Who's the first teacher of Quran among the human beings? The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa When Allah says, Allah al Quran, it necessarily included is that in the teaching is the teacher. You even have the gift of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa In another place in the Quran, Allah asks a very tough question. Those are the ayat I was going to cover originally in Al Imran. وَكَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ تُتْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتُ اللَّهِ وَفِيكُمْ رَسُولُهُ How will you disbelieve? Among you is the messenger, among, among you the ayat are being recited of Allah, and even among you is the messenger of Allah. How would you disbelieve? Mercy upon mercy. Because the Qur'an is being described as mercy, and even the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is described as mercy. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Right? That's mercy also. But coming da- but back to this point, there is a comparison between us and the rest of creation. Between hum- human beings and the rest of creation. Human beings are supposed, the other creation is supposed to be less than us. But they don't budge, they don't violate. And Allah says, He set the, you know, he set the sky, He placed it down and He put a balance on it. He set, it. he set a scale for it. But then He says to us, Allah fil mizan, that you should look, look at that balance and you should learn that you should never violate the balance. You shouldn't do it. When we look at, you know, and some ulama commented, there's chaos in the world, right? There's chaos. There's people cheating each other, people swindling each other out of their homes. There's Wall Street, there's, you know, Midtown, there's, you know, maybe even Hillside, I don't know. But, uh, but there's corruption in the world. There's wars, there's, there's corruption, you know, there's crime. But, you know, as far as the, and these are things that human beings do. But as far as the creation of Allah is concerned, the sun comes up and the sun goes down. And the bird leaves its, tr- its nest and it comes back to its nest. 
you know? And the wind blows and the clouds move and what Allah created that all these other creations, they stick to the plan. They stay in harmony. And we look at all this other creation and we don't learn. We don't learn, subhanAllah. This is just some reflections from this remarkable, remarkable surah. And the, the bottom line of it, the bottom line of it that I want to share with you, is that Qur'an deserves our time. The Qur'an deserves our attention. The Qur'an deserves that we try to learn its language. And by the way, I, and this will be the last point, you know, the, the, the bottom point, the bottom line of this entire lecture, when Allah said, Allamahu al-Bayan, He taught the speech. What did we say the, the best use of that speech will be? The best use of that speech will be to understand and learn the Qur'an. You know necessarily what that does? What that does necessarily is learning the language of the Qur'an is something Allah made us capable of. Nobody can say, I can't learn Arabic. They can't say. Maybe they will, somebody will get more advanced than other people. Somebody will do better than, someone will do better than others. Someone will take, have to take a, little, a few more classes or cry a little more, or when they draw the letter Jim, it looks like the map of Pakistan or something. <laughs> but, that'll happen. But in the end, Allah's guarantee, if you're looking for His mercy, He will make it easy. That's, that's not up to you. Making it easy is not your, jo your job. That's something Allah has taken Himself. You and I just have to make the commitment. We just have to make the commitment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us an appreciation of Allah's Messenger, and may Allah give us an appreciation and love of His book. Uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala barakallahu li wa lakum fil qur'an al-hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-hakim wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh